All right. Thank you again for giving me the opportunity to share more of our experience with, uh, this time, the new allocation system. And I want to apologize before I say anything about any irresponsible editorializing I'm about to do with whatever limited data I have. <laughs> yep, done. So um, I'm not going to spend too much time discussing the changes. I think that they've been covered today. Um, but I, I think everyone in the room, you know, many of us are uh, heavily involved with our transplant programs, uh, were educated on it when they came out, the rationale for them, the plan for calibration in the future. But I'm going to give you a little perspective for programs in our region and in, in, in our DSA. Um, ever since, you know, for us, uh, and, and since the new allocation system, every heart transplant cardiologist in the state of Virginia wakes up and kisses broader sharing on the face. Because for years, it almost seems like we've been, uh, and, it, and we didn't realize this until the system changed, or we did, and, you know, didn't really voice the concern, but it feels like almost as we've been gerrymandered by the DSA borders in, on the East Coast and, and, and have had to function in a way that, that was very different from, from people in Texas or the West Coast or the Midwest. And, and that's why I think you see a lot, many different opinions on how to approach someone who's dying with advanced heart failure, depending on what programs you come from across the country. So this has been an, an awakening for many of us who've trained and grew up, especially in the central uh, East Coast area. And, um, and, and I think you'll see uh, uh, some of that con uh, conveyed in the data I'm about to present. So I, I, we're definitely not going to go over this in detail. Um, this, this is certainly for reference and I think was covered and all of us struggle with this, uh, understanding where our patients belong and have to refer to some kind of idiot's guide when we're listing somebody. But um, I think we're, we're all getting better, and I think the criteria, and, this, and again, editorializing, but I think the, um, the criteria for getting people into each category have been further refined to avoid manipulation of the system. I do, I do think they're onerous, but they're helpful in making sure the right patients are, are sick enough before an intervention takes place, and they're, they're better than before in, in, uh, as far as accurately uh, handling severity of illness and putting people in the right category. This was a concept, and um, again, uh, um, I, I poorly understood until, until the allocation change. Um, the concept of broader sharing, uh, which was introduced um, and moving outside of the old system. In the old system, if you, if, you know, these wiggly lines that I've drawn with PowerPoint are two different donor service areas. And what, how, how organs were allocated in, in that system was that people at the two highest tiers, 1A or 1B, were given preference to local organs. And now what's happened is we've extended that, and, and um, at least in the first round of allocation, to 500 miles, so that a recipient in the blue donor service area will have access to an organ in the green donor service area um, before a lesser severe patient in that green donor service area will be offered a local organ. So basically, it's giving weight to people uh, that are a greater geographic distance away or outside of the local area um, uh, with, with higher severity of illness. So what's happened at our program? So what we've seen, and, and I don't have this with the uh, October 2018 cutoff, this is um, just going to be presented mainly by calendar year, but what we've seen is an increase in heart offers, we've seen an increase in heart transplant volume, and that number is year to date, that's with two months still pending. We've seen a marked decrease in heart transplant waitlist time, and this is uh, individual patient waitlist time. Uh, the year is the year the patient was transplanted, not listed, and it's overall waitlist time at all categories, um, uh, just time on list. Um, the, this is a, a box and whisker plot, so the solid lines are median, probably the most valid value to follow. The boxes are interquartile ranges, and the whiskers are full ranges, and the outliers are little circles. So um, that, that, I mean, if that's not telling. What's also happened in our region, and is, uh, I think data has been put up 
on the wait time for status ones and twos earlier from the national data, and we saw times ranging from 10 to 14 days. The average wait time for someone that's a status one or two in our region is six days. This, uh, this is our um, group's practice currently. These, these are the current statuses of patients at the time of transplant, okay? So predominantly, I'd say two-thirds of patients are either a status one or two at our program, and then one-third are either a status three or four, approximately. It's about a 60-40 split. And um, uh, all three of the status fours that have been transplanted this year are favorable blood type shorter than 5.8. Basically, non-blood type O shorter than 5.8. These, this is over the last four calendar years. This is the devices that were, uh, that were supporting the patients at the time of transplant. So the gray line are, are durable LVADs. The, um, the, or, uh, the yellow line are total artificial hearts. The dashed lines of various colors, uh, the light blue is an intraaortic balloon pup, the um, orange dotted line or ECMO, and no device is the uh, darker blue line, so bridge to transplant on inotropes. And I, I think this is very similar to um, some of the trends that uh, Dr. Skipper was alluding to at his institution and that you see a decline in number of patients with any durable device to bridge to transplantation, including LVADs. Um, it's hard to uh, define a trend for the um, TAHs, but there we're, have, we've only transplanted two of our, device, our patients from TAH this year. Uh, this is not the number of devices implanted in the year. This is just the patients who were transplanted, what they were supported with. And of course, a marked increase in the number of patients transplanted directly from an IABP or no device. So looking at our data as far as the impact of the change in allocation system on ischemic time, um, again, this is a box and whisker plot. The median is ischemic times for the patients undergoing heart transplant have not changed. We are going longer distances, but the patients undergoing transplant are actually less complicated in that um, there are not uh, there are fewer reduced sternotomies, and the surgical time therefore is uh, there's been a trade-off with uh, distance and, and complexity of surgery. And this is the impact on hospital length of stay. Now, of course, we're living in the moment, so I don't have survival data. I don't have granular data on the impact of rejection and midterm allograft outcomes, but we'll look at some proxy values of how complicated the hospital course was, and maybe this is some kind of, uh, uh, um, may portend what's gonna happen down the line. So again, the median hospital length of stay has not um, changed significantly over the years in the new allocation system. What I'm gonna show is more granular data, and this is gonna be a harder to follow slide, but these are um, these are a list of all of the transplants included in the analysis here by support type. So if you start on the, on the right side of the screen at the top, you see ECMO patients and the four patients supported with ECMO and the hospital length of stay after heart transplantation. So this does not include the lead up time. We're talking about post transplant length of stay. Um, and other than the uh, one patient who had a fairly uncomplicated post-transplant course and was discharged after 12 days. The other three patients all had hospital courses that ranged from one and a half to two months in duration, post-ECMO, with a median, well, I, I don't think the median has much value here, if we just look at the raw values here. Uh, patients bridged with an intraoratoric balloon pump have had a median hospital length of stay of 16 days after heart transplantation. Those bridged with an LVAD, there was one outlier that was in the hospital for four months with post-transplant complications, including renal failure, um, uh, and, but the others ranged from 20 to 30 days, the three other patients who were bridged from an LVAD to transplant. Patients without any device, so bridged with inotropes, had a median hospital length of stay of 18 days, and the range is there. 
And then the TAH patients, uh, one had a hospital length of stay of 15 days, and the one that was 47 days was a fairly complicated patient, and as our one post-transplant mortality was a triple organ transplant that unfortunately had an intraoperative and post-operative course that included a neurologic event and a, and a, um, and, uh, and, uh, a multi-organ failure soon afterwards. Um, what has the impact been on our overall device implant strategy year by year? Um, so here's what's happened over the last several years as far as devices implanted at our center. Um, our DT population continues to be fairly stable. Um, I, we've had an increase in number of referrals generally over the last few years, and if I had to sort of give a my suspicion of what's going on is we, if we had not changed the allocation system, we'd probably have five to ten more people in the DT category here because we've become a little more liberal with some of our softer contraindications to heart transplantation when we're weighing the idea of do I implant someone with an LVAD and have them get that additional two pounds off or offer them heart transplantation because they're here in the ICU and avoid an additional surgery. So we've, we've become a little more lenient, not willingly, but we have become a little more lenient uh, in a case-by-case in -case basis. But overall, uh, you've seen a marked decline in any durable device um, uh, for the strategy of implanting for heart transplantation, especially LVADs. Our BTT LVAD program is essentially non-existent in this for the last 16 to 18 months. Uh, we still have implanted TAHs and considered TAHs in patients um, who are in shock. Four implants this year, um, and, and since the change in the allocation system, I think a total of seven or eight implants since October of 2018. Um, and I'll stop there, and, and I'm very interested to hear from other people in the room what, what they're seeing in their region of the country, and if this, you know, mimics or echoes um, uh, experiences at their individual programs. Hey, Ashwin Ravi Chandran, St. Vincent, Indianapolis. We've actually had growth in both our durable device space as well as transplants. We're a net importer of organs in Region 10 in Indiana, and our transplant volume has gone up by about 25%. Uh, we've done 54 so far this year, and we've done about 90 durable VADs. We have struggled, though, just like everybody else in the room has, with the best strategy for the patients. And we try to think about long-term outcomes first, and then, you know, what the patient preference is along with that, obviously. Kind of deciding on balloon pump support as a status two, and then determining whether or not they're going to respond to that therapy and actually be eligible for a good outcome trans post-transplantation, or do they need a durable VAD? Much like you guys, we have the same issues with blood type O and, and size, um, but uh, for the most part, I think our probably experience is very similar to what you just presented. So, lengths of stay have actually been higher, though, I would say. Uh, one of the things that we've encountered um, that's been very difficult to deal with is dual organ transplant. Um, in the old system, the local OPO would allow us to pull the kidney or liver with the heart and uh, with the current system having to go out of local OPO makes that almost impossible to negotiate and uh, that's becoming a real problem because we have an increasing number of dual organ listings. Are you guys seeing a great variation in length of stay by bridging strategy? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I would say the people that we're trying to get through with temporary support devices or temporary forms of support, whatever that may be, central mags or balloon pumps or whatever, they tend to be sicker at the time of transplantation, and they tend to have longer courses inclusive of going to inpatient rehab and things like that. So that's been our experience. Yeah. And then they buy the pre-transplant length of stay, which is a week, two weeks, four weeks of lounging around the hospital, yeah. Just, just a question, because uh, everyone seems to say their transplant volume is going up, and I presume there hasn't been any change in the number of donors in the United States, so it means someone else's volume is going down. So if you're showing us shorter waiting times, 
someone else's waiting time is going up while yours is going down because you're playing a different game than they are or you're in a different scenario than them. And if your volume is going up, someone else's is going down because either they don't have the same cards in the deck to play whatever game you're playing. So uh, what's the other side of the story? Is everyone you know, having this like fantastic, I'm doing 56 transplants and they all live forever, they all survive. Because, because that's not like, I reviewed the uh, abstracts for a major meeting and there were several abstracts that showed a higher incidence of mortality within, 30, uh, within three months of transplant with the new allocation system. There are lots of negatives coming out, but when I listen to the f presentations here, I'm hearing only positives. So where's the misconnect? No, I think that's a good point. Um, just to clarify a few things, um, I think I'm only presenting from one center in one region, uh, and, and our entire region has benefited from the change in the allocation system, um, or our, our D previous DSA, our local area, uh, folks within the state. Um, when we have short waiting times for patients that are one and two, we've basically, as someone mentioned earlier, abandoned those patients who are stat status four. Um, we have a number of patients who are doing well on LVAD, who are uh, de facto a destination therapy until they have a complication. And so that's been the change is within the patient pool of our own. I can't speak to the other regions where hearts are coming from. I'm, I, I know there's people across the country who were probably doing better in the previous allocation system who were seeing less transplants. But I don't know if any of those people are in the room and would like to comment on that. status ones, whereas previously we were not, you know, wanting to uh, really get to that point. And so we've been taking more risk in that regard. I think from, you know, uh, when we're looking at, you know, BADS in particular, we're, we're taking more risk with the RV dysfunction. And we're seeing a lot of, uh, you know, longer wait, uh, longer uh, times in the hospital length of stay. And so that has been an issue for us. We're not seeing Yes, yes, all the way to Texas. So just one comment. So our volume is flat. We haven't gone up. We haven't gone down. But I think as a program, we've tried to really look at risk-benefit for the patient and put the patient first. Um, you're absolutely right. I mean, if program volumes are going up, others are going down. And the the real crux of the matter is going to be what do outcomes look like in one three five years from now and how do we reconnoiter things um, we may very well have too many hospitals doing transplant we may need uh, a better design of the system um, that's going to get uncomfortable for some and uh, it's going to make other people really happy provided they have the icu space to house the patients so I, I don't think it's been a win for everybody, but in the end, hopefully we can make it a win for the patients. But it's going to require patients not being dead when they get transplanted. And we have to tune these people up. We have to make sure they're really ready for the organ or give the organ to somebody that is ready for it. And that's the only way we're going to win this. So there was a recent presentation at another meeting that Shelley Hall did that said that the facts are that regions one, nine, and 10 have gone up in volume, regions two and three have gone down. So that might explain some of this organ inequity that you're talking about. The other thing that's definitely gone up across the country is hep C hearts. We've done a ton of those too, and that's really, we think, increased our volumes as well as shortened our wait times a bit, so. Who? Just to pass the comment on the issue of operating on patients before they're dead. So I'm sure Dr. Fraser listening to this will probably think that this might be like 1985. And this was probably what pushed him into the whole era of mechanical bridge to transplant. And we're going backwards to 
using inotropes and balloon pumps and waiting for people to be dead before we move to mechanical support. And it's like we're, we're just setting ourselves to repeat history. Like, I don't get what the whole objective is. Because if we see a center like yours, you taught a lot of us how to do TAH, and you've gone down to doing for a year, and yet you're putting balloon pumps in half your patients. It's, and these are all shock patients. So what are we to learn from this exercise? And what's the point of all the 50 years of history that we just listened to at lunchtime? It's like we're, we're going back to the 1980s. Well, for our patient composition, and, and I put this back up here because historically, we, unlike your program in Baylor, the red bars was status 1A patients, where we had to get our patients to to be transplanted. So for us, it almost feels like it's gotten a little bit less severe. Their patients are less sick, and they're able to avoid additional surgery. So we were, in our region, we were a very aggressive program for device implantation of all sorts, because transplant was never a viable option for the less sick patient. So what I suspect is happening across the country is hopefully a great, greater equilibrium of uh, maybe not within each individual program, but across the system of us selecting the right patients for device implantation, patients having an equitable shot at getting an organ if they're trying to get transplanted. And hopefully we all do a good job of identifying who's going to survive and not going to survive in the long term. I think that's we're kind of figuring that part out. All right, thank you very much.